Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a very interesting and a somewhat mysterious supernova remnant known as Cassiopeia A and a recent study that might have actually solved its mystery once and for all. So let's talk a little bit more about this because this is actually a pretty interesting story. The story that technically began around 300 years ago, but no one ever witnessed it. Because despite its size and despite the power involved here, and also despite its relatively close distance to us, 300 years ago none of the prolific astronomers, such as for example Johannes Kepler who discovered the very famous Kepler supernova, nobody saw anything. It's as if the supernova that happened back then was completely invisible to everyone. And that's actually where the mystery starts. How can such a powerful and relatively easily visible event happened during the time when astronomers were actively looking for these events, yet remained completely invisible until roughly around 1948 when this remnant was officially discovered. As a matter of fact, the reason we discovered it was because it was extremely bright in radio waves. And this is actually really fascinating because if you were to look in our galaxy not in visible light, but in radio wave light, you would suddenly start seeing things that are extremely visible like this right here. This is Centaurus A galaxy. That's essentially the brightest radio object in the night skies if you were to look at all of the radio wave frequencies together. And in visible light, it's practically invisible. So you would start discovering these bright objects and one of these objects is, of course, the remnant of Cassiopeia A supernova, which happens to be the brightest radio object in frequencies above 1 GHz. Below 1 GHz, it's still the beautiful Centaurus A galaxy that you see right here, but above that, Cassiopeia A is a lot brighter. But because it's a supernova and because it's actually spreading, it's slowly losing its brightness, approximately 1% per year. So within the next few decades, it's going to lose its status as the number one object, and Centaurus A will actually become the brightest everywhere. But anyway, that's actually the only reason it was discovered back in 1948. But in between its original creation sometime in the 1600s and its discovery, it was completely invisible to us and nobody even knew it existed. And it was very difficult to explain why nobody was there to witness its creation, because supernova, as you know, are extremely bright. Now, eventually we discovered that it was most likely what's known as a stripped envelope supernova. It's essentially a supernova of a star whose outside shell was stripped by some other event, usually another star or another massive object that essentially just steals or somehow sucks in all of this hydrogen material that's present around ancient stars. In other words, these events usually happen in binary systems. There should be another star, a very massive star, that's capable of either stealing or somehow displacing the shell of the expanding old star. And this eventually results in the outer shell dispersing to the outskirts and the core itself eventually losing its ability to be stable and going supernova. And in all cases when we discovered such supernova, the hydrogen itself was absent in the gas that's expanding. Which is of course because all of this gas was either stolen or displaced by the partner. But in case of Cassiopeia A, the mystery was that we couldn't really see any partners. And we also didn't really see any other potential objects, such as for example neutron stars or black holes, that could have stripped the, the original star that went supernova from all of its material. Oh, and by the way, the major explanation for why the supernova was invisible 300 to 400 years ago was essentially because it was most likely covered by this unusual cloud of material that was essentially the stripped material that created a kind of a gas cloud around the exploding star, thus stopping a lot of the light from coming out and preventing the supernova from being too bright. And this is of course what a lot of these stripped envelope supernova are usually like and what they usually end up producing. And so for many decades since the original discovery in 1948, a lot of scientists have been trying to explain what's happening here, trying to understand what's going on and how the supernova is even possible. With the biggest mystery being the missing partner or the missing explanation for what stripped the actual envelope from the star. But in the meanwhile, we've been learning a lot about the supernova itself. Like for example, we know that it's actually pretty hot here. The temperature inside the shell is about 30 million degrees Kelvin. And all of this is expanding at a speed of about 4,000 to about 6,000 kilometers per second. As a result, the shell is around 10 light years across, so it's a pretty large object when you think about it. 
And because we know its size and because we can establish its distance, the scientists were then able to work out when this supernova should have occurred, which probably means that it should have occurred around the year 1650 to maybe 1680. But once again, there wasn't really any major observation of any sudden explosion or sudden event anywhere in the night skies. But luckily for us, there might be an answer after all, specifically from the paper that was recently released that analyzed a lot of the environment around the supernova and discovered something really unusual we haven't seen before. And the explanation in this paper involves two different supernova, two massive stars that go supernova one after another. And so the assumption here was that these two stars were relatively similar in age and in mass. In other words, realistically speaking, they should have been going supernova around the same time but one of them would obviously go supernova a little bit earlier. And by the way, both of these stars are now already in their giant stage, so basically these are extremely large, highly expanded stars with very large envelopes. Here's how our sun compares to both of these objects. So these objects are already huge, but then one of them reaches the point where it can no longer sustain itself, and it goes supernova. And as this happens, the wave from this star, the supernova wave, starts stripping the material from its partner. Essentially, this is how they believe the so-called stripped envelope star was created before the second supernova occurred. And so this here, the first supernova, is going to strip all of the hydrogen from the system and spread it across the larger region. At the same time, this is obviously going to create a relatively large cloud, and most of this is going to cover the second supernova when it occurs. But this probably happened hundreds if not thousands of years before the second supernova, which is why of course nobody was there to witness it. Because this is probably before the age of Kepler, before the age of a lot of other famous astronomers who documented all of their discoveries with a lot of detail. And so now the year is about 1650 or so, and the stripped envelope star is surrounded by this relatively large cloud that's basically going to be blocking all of its light. It now reaches its limit and goes supernova. And this is essentially what we're looking at today. This is what we're seeing in the night skies, the remnants of the supernova from around 1650s. Well, okay, that sounds kind of cool, but where is the proof of any of this? Well, the first proof here was based on the simulations and specifically computer hydrodynamic simulations that establish that this event, if it actually occurred, would definitely be able to produce what we're observing, but at the same time it should leave behind some sort of a shell structure farther away from the star and from the center of the supernova that would essentially represent the uh, wave from the first supernova. And at the same time there should also be some kind of a neutron star traveling somewhere out there, but it's probably going to be invisible to us because it's not really interacting with anything major. And specifically they identified that there should be a sign of a one-sided density at a distance of about 30 to maybe 300 light years away from the center that should have been created as a result of these two supernova, which is indeed what they were later able to discover around 30 light years away from the center, the region right here known as the Minkowski H2 region. And although in some sense this could be something else, maybe it's created by something completely different and it's more of an indirect evidence, at the same time it does prove the computer simulations and the theory behind their paper as well. It does seem to show that an event when two stars go supernova within a relatively close region and within a relatively close time frame would actually produce something extremely similar to what the scientists observed and what they predicted. In other words, we might have actually finally solved the mystery of Cassiopeia A supernova and we might have finally found the reason why it was invisible and also why we can't seem to find any binary partners or neutron stars orbiting in the vicinity. In other words, this definitely explains a lot of things that happen here and provide just the right evidence to make this an actual theory. But I guess for now, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. This is a pretty interesting discovery and I guess it finally solves the mystery of the beautiful Cassiopeia A, which is also one of the coolest supernovae you can see if you have the right telescope and the right filter. You can easily find the supernova if you have a telescope that's about 9 inches or larger and of course if you live in a dark enough environment where light pollution is not a problem. Once we learn more about the supernova or about some other unusual mystery somewhere out there in the universe, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.